It's the morning of the transcontinental race and here we are at Sinon. We're going to have a little chat with the riders about their builds and exactly why they are the way they are. So if you could start with your name, your cap number and where you're from. Yeah, well, my name is Pjorn Lenhardt, my cap number, obviously number two, because of second place last year. And I'm coming from Dresden in Germany. You were second last year, just won the Transatlantic Way race as well. A hot favourite, I think, certainly from what we've seen here. What is your strategy going into the race t this evening? Well, I just ride as fast as I can and as long as I can. <laughs> no, there's no real strategy. I mean, it depends on the wind and the weather, how far I can go till tomorrow evening. And then I will see how I feel. Maybe what the weather says, I mean, if you have nice tailwind, maybe you recycle it one or two hours more. If you have headwind, maybe you stop earlier. Or if you have rain, you stop also. It's, you cannot really, really make out a strategy in the beginning. And in terms of the races that you've done here before, do you have any distinct memory that's your favorite? Oh, well, there are too many memories, to be honest. There are too many stories I could tell, things I have experienced. It's just amazing. <laughs> it, and it's every time, you know, you have new experience, new adventure and meet new people. It's just fantastic. <laughs> And obviously you're a very seasoned uh, ultra-endurance rider. For the people at home that might be watching this and thinking, oh, that's maybe something I could give it a go, what's your piece of advice to a beginner? It's <laughs> a good question. Maybe you should start with, with shorter ways, not just straight away with, with the transatlantic, <laughs> uh, with the transcontinental. And, well, to finish such a race, I mean, you always have to keep in mind, you have to keep moving. Every minute you stop somewhere, it doesn't get you to the finish line. Okay guys, so if we can start off with your names, where you've come from and your cap numbers. Uh, I'm Nico Deportago Cabrera, I'm from Chicago and I'm cap number 256B. My name is Chaz Christensen, I'm from San Francisco, California and I'm 256A. So these guys are riding as a pair and it's not your first time at the Transcontinental, is that right guys? No, this is our second time around. So what happened last year? Well, last year we uh, had a little bit of a problem with our scheduling and we committed to the Cycle Messenger World Championships in Montreal, Canada. And uh, this was our first endurance race ever, so we got a little behind schedule with some routing mishaps and got to the fourth checkpoint and realized we were not going to be able to make our flights to compete in the Worlds. Uh, we didn't have the budget to reschedule, so we scratched at checkpoint four to make World Championships happen for us, which was very bittersweet because we got a taste of the greatness of this type of race, but then had to scratch with one checkpoint to go. So we vowed before we even left checkpoint four that we would be back again. And here you are, fantastic. So what are you doing this year? Uh, having done the race last year, is there any things that you've changed in terms of your setup or your strategy with the route or anything? Nico? Definitely. So last year we kind of routed ourselves as if it was an alley cat race. Like, all right, what's the straightest line to get to the checkpoint? And we'll go there because that's where we come from. And in doing so, we wound up cutting a lot of mileage but adding a whole lot of elevation, <laughs> uh, which doesn't seem as, you know, stressful on paper, but then when you get out there in the field, it's like, oh, this is why you ride a little longer to go around the mountain. So we definitely were smarter with our routing this year. But one of the big things we did this year that we didn't have last year was having a dynamo hub yeah. to power our lights and also be able to charge stuff while we're moving. Um, we wound up having to carry so much extra gear last year, extra battery packs, wall plugs, everything. We would have to stop so much more often so we could charge things. And this setup this year will help keep us moving. We'll be able to ride longer into the night and spend more time in the saddle. Yeah, for sure. Nice yeah. one. And Chaz, just about your bike, can you just talk us a little bit through your frame? It's something quite special you've got there. Yeah, definitely. This is a low frame. It's hand-built in San Francisco by a friend of mine, Andrew Lowe. He uh, started out building track frames, and he's gone on to, some say, real bikes, but gravel and road bikes. So this is special to me because it was built six blocks from my house by a friend of mine. And uh, it's all set up with a SRAM ETAP Hydro, which is nice because we can charge our ETAP shifter batteries with our dyno hubs. Nice. So we're kind yeah. of like a weird closed ecosystem. <laughs> Of, of cycling where we're like very high technology but also very self-contained and I kind of have a menagerie of bags but all built in San Francisco uh, by a friend of mine outer shell um, to kind of just make it happen try and carry as little as, as I can but as much as I need you've definitely gone for the sort of like the shoe doping 
glasses doping approach. For me, it's the it's the little bit of motivation that helps when it gets really tough to just like have that little bit of color, or that little bit of flair to just remind me like this is fun. This is like stay lighthearted. This is a shout out to my friend JP from Tokyo and Squid Bikes. They had the idea of painting the shoes to match the glasses, and I saw them do it for track lacrosse nationals, and I was like, that's my TCR jam right there. Nice. Well, best of luck, guys. We'll be Thank following you. on uh, Dot Tracker. Cap and, two, yeah. five, six. two five six. Two five six. Cool, so if you could start by telling us your name, your cap number and where you're from. Sure, so Roger Seaton, cap number 34 and I'm from the UK. Excellent, thank you. And I believe this isn't your first transcontinental, is that right? Yeah, I did it last year but I pulled out due to family reasons quite early after Frank unfortunately was killed. And this year, you're not just going to try and do the same thing again, you've gone for a slightly different tact. <laughs> you've gone for a Brompton. Tell me a bit about that. Well, I said if I was ever going to do this again, I'd do it on my most fun bike. And I have fun every time I ride this bike. Also, I smile a lot. And I'm thinking, get on the bike in the morning after a long previous day, it's good to smile. So I decided to do this on the Chapter 3 Brompton. Excellent. And I think what we've noticed most about this bike is, obviously, there's not a massive amount of storage space. So it's used very wisely. What are your little hacks that we've got on this one? So first of all, you don't need most. The more you've got, the more you've got to carry. So very, very minimal gear. But obviously the luggage at the back has got the minimal mount in it. We've got things like uh, spare inners, tape between the frames, a spare tire just in case because I reckon pram tires are going to be hard to get somewhere I'm going. Probably, um, yeah. And that's the hardest thing. Tires in this, yeah, they're going to be quite hard to source if you wreck one. So it's basically optimising all the space for performance and making sure that it's as light as possible, streamlined, nothing gets in the way, nothing's falling off or rattling, which is really irritating. Fantastic. And you say it's something you've ridden a lot before. Is it something that you've been training on, both especially for the longer distance type miles? Yeah, sure. So I commute on one of these daily, and I've done so for about five or six years now. But on doing this on the, on the Brompton, gone for long back-to-back -back rides, so 300, 400 plus kilometre rides um, back to back, which is the key thing, back to back, hill repeats, which you know brings a smile to club riders' faces <laughs> when they go past me. Um, yeah, just making sure you know you can you can get the speed up. So the average speeds are a bit slower and you take a bit more effort, but it can be done. So making sure that ultimately can this be done on a Brompton? And it can be. Well I think it could be a world first. Best of luck. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So before we get onto this bike Will you start by giving us your name, your cap number and where you're from? Hi, I'm René, I'm cap number 158 and I'm from Germany. Fantastic, thank you. And we actually came across this bike before we spotted René. Um, we'll take a closer look at every individual part because this is quite a spectacular home build. Um, so am I right in thinking that all the, what I can only call hacks, on this bike you've made yourself, is that right? Yes. So. Um, I don't even know where to start. Let's <laughs> start in front of us on the um, aero bars here. You've got a little compartment. What have you got in there? I've got mostly food in there. So this is just cliff bars, basically. Yeah. Um, and it also has my, my backup light and my main light here and my spot tracker and a small computer, which I have for my power meter. And interestingly, we talked about suspension. Um, you've got both the canyon seat post and a suspension stem on the front there. How do, what's that one there? It's a redshift suspension stem. And I think it's really important in such a long race that you're comfortable on your bike because yeah. it's not about going fast. It's more about the time you can spend on your bike. So if you can stay for half an hour longer on your bike because you're not that fatigued, not that tired, then it's totally worth it. Absolutely. And sort of not just the storage we've got on front here, but all of the storage, I can't even call them bags, that you've <laughs> made on your bike. They're all made of carbon fibre, is that right? Yeah, it's made of carbon fibre and, and this one here, this material on top is called Cuban fibre. It's a material which is used in, in sailing okay. because it's super light and super strong. Fantastic. And that's all completely waterproof? Yes. Great. So. In addition to the pack on the front here, we've got the sort of extended top tube bag. Also one in the back there. What's that one for? Uh, the one in the back is for my sleeping gear. Okay. So for my sleeping bag and my sleeping mattress. And I also take a bivy, which is uh, in my pocket from my uh, tri suit. Yeah, fantastic. And then there's some other really interesting parts that aren't for storage. So you've got two bottle cages. What are they for? They are for coke because uh, you, all <laughs> you always need uh, caffeine and sugar. So I have uh, two bottle cages which are a bit smaller for normal coke bottles which you can get at a petrol station. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I noticed we've got some aero fairing, is that on the forks? Yeah, it's just an aero fairing to yeah. make the fork that little bit more aerodynamic. 
Fantastic. And just one other little thing that I've noticed on the back there by your rear derailleur. What's that for? Uh, it's for my toothbrush, but the one for cleaning the chain and also for the chain oil. Fantastic. That's, that's brilliant. So when will we be expecting to see you in Meteora? Um, I'm not sure yet because it's such a long race, so a lot of things can go wrong and can happen. But um, if it all goes well, I would hope for finish in 10 days or maybe a bit faster. We'll see. So if you could start off by telling us your name, where you're from and your cap number, please. Okay, my name is Anna Petters and uh, I'm uh, originally from Sweden. I'm living in France right now and my cup number is 97. Fantastic. Now, I understand this isn't your first long distance event, but it's your first transcontinental, is that right? Yes. So what have you done before this? Uh, I did the length of Sweden in uh, 2016 and I finished that uh, and that was fun. It was very hard, uh, but it was fun. And how long is the length of Sweden? That's a bit more than 2,000 kilometers. Wow. So it's about half the length of what you're going to be starting this evening. Yeah, I felt like I was uh, in for a bit of more. Yeah? yeah, great. And your strategy in terms of how you're going to be riding and sleeping, yeah. what have you got planned for that? Uh, I think I'm going to try to sleep out as much as possible because uh, that makes me more flexible. And uh, but I'm not going to torture myself. If I find a nice hotel and it's uh, right on time, I'm going to take it. Fantastic. And we've talked a little bit about your setup and your kit. What's your one piece of little luxury that you're taking with you and why? I think I'm going to take my nail polish. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. Nice little perk when you're feeling low. Yeah, exactly. And obviously you're a really strong rider. Having got through the, um, the length of Sweden is not easy at all, especially with those weather conditions. Yeah. Um, what do you do to prepare, not necessarily on the bike, but mentally for when you're having a bit of a struggle, when things get tough? That is going to get better because I know uh, from touring uh, solo all the time and doing everything myself, I know that I can uh, work through it. I just need a calm moment, use my brain, think about it, and then I know I will be fine in the end. And uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, me biking and it's only a bike race and uh, that's it. So. And we have 21 women on the start line this year out of 240. Why do you think that is and why aren't there more women here? Uh, I think it's a lot about the preconceived ideas uh, that a lot of women have in themselves that uh, being alone on the road with a bike, meeting uh, people, um, being afraid of being alone, meeting people and uh, of course stuff can happen but I think most people generally are kind and they want good for you and you should have uh, that closest to your heart and uh, not be afraid. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that there is less ladies, but it's really not that bad. And uh, you just have to trust uh, yourself and that you can do it and you can solve all the technical stuff. But basically that people around you are kind. So here we are with Yanis's bike. And Yanis is from Greece, so it's essentially a ride home for him. And underneath this really stunning paint which Janice did himself is a true British classic. There's a Hercules and it's actually got a custom made uh, fork there for this bike. It comes complete with a Shimano Tiagra group set, so a little more modern there. Uh, full Apogee bike packing bags and a very comfortable brook saddle and some really sweet little finishing details. We've got flip flops on the top there for some time off the bike and also a lucky charm on the front from one of his friends back home. So Janice, we're just over 24 hours before the start now before you ride home back to Greece. How are you feeling about it? I'm exciting. <laughs> it's my first time here. Yeah. Uh, and it's amazing to be here for me because uh, I show this uh, race uh, years now. Yeah. And uh, it was my dream to, to be part of, yeah. this, uh, of this race. Fantastic. And in the build up to this race, have you been doing lots of long distance bike rides, maybe any other events in the build up to it? Uh, no, I'm a long distance cyclist. Uh, and it's my first time uh, to go in race, yeah. in race mood. Yeah. Uh, all my uh, trips, uh, it's, uh, it's classic, with classic panniers, uh, with my classic bike, etc. Maybe on your own? Uh, yeah. yeah, all the and time. And so, <laughs> to be here in Herzberg and with all these people who are into the same sort of thing, into this long distance atmosphere, how does that feel? Oh, it's, uh, it's something new for me. Yeah. <laughs> Something new, Exciting. yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic, well, best of luck, we'll be watching. <laughs>
So that's just a fraction of the riders and their setups from this year's transcontinental race. And all there's left to do now is to see them off going up the Muir and then follow their progress over the next couple of weeks. If you'd like to check out more from our trip to the transcontinental, click just down here and don't forget to subscribe.